Hello, welcome back to another breaking news update. My name is Jimmy Boyd, and you were watching Boyd News. I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm back with some more updates coming out from the war between Russia and Ukraine, and I've got a ton of huge news to brief you on today. We're going to start off with this story that we see here on your screen as Russia is preparing a major offensive in the Zaporizhia region of Ukraine. Now, I have been reporting this to you guys uh, quite a bit over the last few days. We've seen multiple reports that it looks like Russian soldiers could be preparing a major offensive in the Zaporizhia region. This is in like southeastern Ukraine, and I will show you guys on a map in just a minute in case you're not familiar with this area. Uh, but it looks like we could be potentially seeing a major offensive, and I reported to you guys yesterday that Ukraine was turning the Zaporizhia region into a fortress. They've been building uh, trenches. They've been setting up dragon's teeth. Uh, they are preparing a major attack in that area from the Russians, apparently. And we also know that uh, very close to Mariupol, we heard recently that North Korean troops could also be at some of the training grounds down there, which is not too far away from the Zaporizhia region. So it's very possible we could even be seeing North Korean troops being deployed to this area at some point soon as well. Okay, so we're going to talk more about North Korea also, as I have reports that last night North Korea fired a, a uh, intercontinental ballistic missile and it landed in the sea uh, near the Sea of Japan. So we're going to talk about that as well. And then multiple reports also updating you in regards to North Korean troops getting involved in the war with Ukraine. And then also last night, we had a major attack inside of Kharkiv. We had another residential building that was struck. I think 36 people so far being injured and reports of two, maybe three people that have died, including children. So very unfortunate situation. I want to show you guys that as well. So we're going to go ahead and hop into the news. I want to start sharing some of these details with you guys. So we're going to jump on over to X now. We have this report from Max24. Russia is preparing an offensive in Zaporizhia region with armored vehicles, spokesman of the AFU Voloshin said. Russians have already conducted training in the occupied territory. Armored vehicles are planned to be used in the areas of two settlements. Okay, so it looks like we could have multiple attacks. Um, upwards of 200,000 Russian troops, maybe even North Koreans could be getting involved as well. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, down in the Zaporizhia region, and uh, we've been seeing multiple reports coming out in regards to the Zaporizhia region recently, and it looks like the Russians could potentially be trying to maybe cut off the Donetsk region and try to secure it. I think that's what they might be trying to do here. So I pulled open this map to show you guys. This is actually an old map, but it still shows, uh, for the most part, the areas that are occupied by Russia. And it says here from Ukraine battle map, full map of Ukraine, May 2nd, 2022, Russia holds about 20.8% of Ukraine. So this is obviously an old map that came out May 1st, 2022, but this map will work to show you guys kind of what I'm talking about here. So Zaporizhia is right here. This is the town of Zaporizhia, and this is kind of the Zaporizhia region right here. And then we've got Dnipro as well. Here's the Donetsk region in this area over here. So I'm thinking right along this line here is probably where we will see a lot of these attacks coming. This is like southeastern Ukraine right here. And then also here's the city of Mariupol where we heard recently, I reported to you guys, that uh, some of the partisans in the area of Mariupol were reporting that they saw some North Korean troops um, at some of the training grounds for the Russians in this area. So if you see, it's not too far away from uh, the Zaporizhia region here, where the Russians could be potentially attacking, and they might be trying to push and cut off the entire Donetsk region over here and trying to encircle this. This could be what the Russians could be preparing to do uh, very soon. So uh, we'll probably get more information on that. Right now, all I'm really seeing is updates today from multiple sources on X stating that the Russians are preparing a major offensive in this area. And again, we're hearing upwards of 200,000 Russian troops in this area preparing a massive offensive into the Zaporizhia region, which is right in this area here. Okay, so very big news in regards to that. So we're going to move on now to uh, North Korea. We're going to be talking about multiple subjects, but first we're going to talk about this ICBM that they launched last night. So from the informant, defense officials from South Korea and Japan said the intercontinental ballistic missile launched by North Korea tonight could reach well beyond the east coast of the United States. According to the Japanese Ministry of Defense, the missile's flight time was approximately 1 hour and 26 minutes, the longest ever recorded for a North Korean ballistic missile, indicating that maybe a new ICBM variant. So if you notice that new ICBM variant 
is uh, possible what they tested here, okay? The missile was launched on a high trajectory toward the Sea of Japan, where it reportedly landed west of Okushiri Island in Hokkaido. I think it's Hokkaido, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The United States strongly condemned North Korea's recent test of an intercontinental ballistic missile, calling it a flagrant violation of several UN Security Council resolutions, a White House official said on Wednesday, according to FAIR. Uh, National Security Council spokesman Sean Sabat said Washington will take all necessary measures to ensure the security of the United States, South Korea, and Japan. So this was a recent... Uh, uh, ICBM launcher, I believe, that uh, North Korea was displaying at some point in the recent past. Um, I don't remember hearing too much about this, but uh, this was pictures being shared here on X from uh, North Korea, okay? Here's also a picture of a uh, ballistic missile that uh, is being fired inside of North Korea as well. So, um, obviously, this is dangerous if, uh, if North Korea is launching these ICBMs. And if they could be targeting countries like the United States, then, you know, could we potentially see a response from the U.S.? Um, some people would even say that, you know, the U.S. should have responded to North Korea a long time ago. Uh, they've obviously been testing lots of uh, ballistic missiles being fired very close to Japan many times. We've heard uh, lots of reports of that just this year. So definitely the North Koreans are not playing around and they, are, they don't seem to be phased by the United States and South Korea. Um, and any of its partners over there in the Indo-Pacific region. So definitely more, uh, more escalation that we're seeing here with North Korea, and uh, they are even showing force of using ICBMs, potentially even with nuclear warheads on them, okay? So very crazy situation. We're going to move on to another update now from Ozan Defender. The president of South Korea, Yoon suk Yul, has called for a strong response to last night's uh, launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile by North Korea into the Sea of Japan, with him directing the National Security Council to prepare for further surprise provocations. So interesting, right? Surprise provocations. So it looks like South Korea is going to be responding to this intercontinental ballistic uh, missile launch. And uh, we'll see what they choose to do to respond to this. Uh, we're probably going to be seeing... Maybe even more reports of drones flying over North Korea again. Who knows what they're going to do. But definitely on the Korean Peninsula right now, tensions are very high. And uh, North Korea doesn't seem to be very happy with what's happening over there as well. Okay, so moving on to another update from Nexta. South Korea reveals what the DPRK may ask the Kremlin in exchange for military aid. According to South Korean Defense Minister Kim Jong-un, in exchange for troops, the DPRK is likely to demand from Russia, the transfer of technologies related to tactical nuclear weapons, the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles, reconnaissance satellites, and nuclear submarines. Okay, so it looks like uh, North Korea could be getting a major upgrade, especially with their nuclear program. And uh, this was apparently reported by the Defense Minister of South Korea. We have heard some of this information already, that uh, nuclear technology could be exchanged for North Korea in return for sending troops over to Russia. So that's probably why they're sending these troops over there. But nonetheless, we have been hearing that at least 10 to uh, 12,000 North Korean troops are currently inside of Russia, with uh, over 10,000 more expected to arrive soon. Okay, so huge news coming out from there. Also from Anton Gershenko, the Ukrainian government has named three North Korean generals accompanying at least 500 North Korean officers sent to Russia. Okay, so it looks like we've got generals also showing up inside of Russia from North Korea. One of them, Colonel General Kim uh, Yong Buk. He is a senior general with uh, command of Special Forces troops, including the Xi Corps, also known as the Storm Corps, with the uh, South Korean Intelligence Service said has been dispatched to Russia. Also in remarks to the UN Security Council, Ukraine's delegation stated that plans call for the North Korean troops to be formed into at least five formations of two to 3,000 soldiers each and integrated into Russian units to conceal their presence. We've already been hearing about that, that uh, many of these North, North Korean soldiers are being given uh, fake passports um, and information IDs showing that they are actually Russian citizens, not North Koreans. Here's a picture of some North Korean generals. Um, and uh, yes, what we're hearing is upwards of uh, three North Korean generals as well being sent over to uh, over to Russia to uh, also provide support for these troops there. Okay, so very big news that we continue to see more heavy involvement of the North Koreans uh, being involved with Russia. Okay, 
So also we're going to move on to another update now from the Kiev Independent. Putin will not prevail in Ukraine even with the uh, North Korean help, U.S. Defense Secretary says. Austin said the U.S. was working with allies to discourage Russia from employing these troops, uh, employing these troops in combat. Excuse me. So uh, this was reported yesterday from uh, the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin from the United States. Him coming out saying basically that uh, you know obviously Russia will not win even with North Korea's help, and uh, they're doing everything they can apparently to discourage Russia. The U.S. and NATO's already called on Russia to uh, to you know withdraw these troops. Don't send them into combat. Uh, we have been seeing some reports, which I will show you, that potentially even some North Korean troops have been killed already. So it looks like they are on the front line uh, with the information that we're seeing. Here's that report right here from Igor Sushko. Russia, seven North Korean soldiers reportedly killed by Ukrainian armed forces on the front line in the Kursk region. One North Korean soldier surrendered. Okay, so... Uh, I haven't heard any information about this North Korean soldier who has surrendered that was captured. Uh, we did hear that South Korea may send some military uh, intelligence officers over to Ukraine. Uh, that is not confirmed yet, but they may send them to uh, to provide support for the Ukrainian troops um, and uh, provide intelligence on how the North Koreans operate and also be able to interrogate some of these North Korean soldiers if they are captured. So we'll see if that's confirmed uh, in the coming days or weeks. But uh, also, you know, many reports coming out recently of North Korean soldiers being killed reportedly already in the Kursk region. We've seen this a couple times already over the last few days. Okay, also from Max 24, Russia communicated with uh, the West and officially confirmed at the intelligence level that the North Korean soldiers will fight against Ukraine. There is clear information, I am sure of it. Okay, this came out from Volodymyr Zelensky, I believe in the last 24 hours, him stating this. So he's very certain that... The North Korean troops are uh, there, you know, they're not there sightseeing. They are there to uh, fight against Ukraine. And again, we are seeing some reports of already uh, fighting between the North Koreans and Ukraine. So also from Colby uh, Bodwar, Yonhop, a news agency reports, South Korea is not considering direct provision of 155 art millimeter artillery shells to Ukraine, according to the presidential office. Okay, so provide another batch of them indirectly via the United States then. Okay, so uh, we were hearing also from South Korea that they may send these 155 millimeter artillery shells in response to North Korean troops uh, joining the fight. They might send them over to Ukraine. And it uh, looks like we're hearing that South Korea is not considering sending these over directly, um, but maybe they'll do it indirectly through some other country. So we'll see what happens here. Also from uh, Ukrainska Pravda in English, Zelensky says if partners reveal classified details about Ukraine's military needs, it shows they don't want to give anything. Okay, so yesterday I showed you guys a few videos of Vladimir Zelensky speaking uh, with some uh, some foreign journalists or European journalists, excuse me, uh, just yesterday in like a press conference. And uh, he was really complaining a lot about how Ukraine's not getting a lot of support, uh, that they've received apparently only like 10% of all the packages that have uh, been approved for Ukraine, even including air defenses. They still lack like six or seven that were agreed to be sent to Ukraine and they still have not received them. Um, and then also he's been complaining that classified details of the victory plan was leaked recently regarding Tomahawk missiles for Ukraine to be used for a non-deterrent or non-nuclear deterrent package to protect Ukraine and also try to end this war. And this information apparently got leaked once again from uh, the U.S. Pentagon. And uh, he came out saying that it shows that they don't want to give anything, that potentially they could be doing this on purpose to sabotage uh, the uh, confidential details and also reveal it to Russia so that way they don't have to send it over is kind of the way that I see it. But that's what uh, Zelensky was stating recently as well. Also for Max24, if Trump, in case of victory, wants to end the war by forcing Ukraine to lose its territories, then he will not succeed, according to Zelensky. Okay, so we know that uh, Donald Trump... Um, most likely a big part of his plan to try to end this war is uh, we've been hearing even from J.D. Vance, his vi uh, vice presidential pick, coming out and stating that uh, Ukraine will be forced to give up the territories to kind of end this war. But Zelensky still standing firm and saying, well, we're not going to allow that to happen. We're going to keep fighting until we get all of our territory back. We're not going to let Russia uh, claim these territories. I believe he's even talking about Crimea as well. So 
that's going to be very interesting if we see a Trump presidency in the United States here very soon in the next few months. Um, because even as presidential elect, he's come out and said he would end this war uh, before he even becomes president in the United States. So in the next couple months, uh, will that happen? And if it does, how is Ukraine going to deal with that in terms of giving up their territories if uh, we have Donald Trump putting pressure on uh, on Volodymyr Zelensky to do so? Okay, so obviously it'd be a different story if we get Kamala Harris. So we'll see what happens. All right, so also we're going to talk about the Kharkiv region now, I've got a few posts here to discuss with you guys as we had a Russian glide bomb striking a residential building just last night in Kharkiv, Ukraine. Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, posts, Russia struck a nine-story building in Kharkiv with a guided aerial bomb. Tragically, there are casualties, including children, and more people may still be trapped under the rubble. All necessary emergency services are on site. Partners see what happens every day in these circumstances. Every delayed decision on their part means dozens or even hundreds more Russian bombs used against Ukraine. Their decisions are the lives of our people. This is why we must stop Russia together and do so with all possible force. So we got a six second clip here of the damage to this uh, residential building that was struck directly from a Fab 500 glide bomb. So go ahead and take a look at this six seconds long. <laughs> Okay, so from this video footage, we can definitely see a massive hole in the side of this residential building. Looks like some cars were destroyed outside as well. So again, what's being reported is 36 people so far as of today have been injured and two, maybe three people, I'm hearing as high as three, have been killed in these strikes. Uh, I think two of them may be uh, being children as well. One of them were trapped under the rubble. We've got reports that talk about that here. The Ukrainian Review, the boy who was killed by a terrorist country was 11 years old. And it says here, uh, he was freed from the rubble with severe head injuries and fractures. Doctors performed resuscitation measures for more than half an hour. Unfortunately, it was not possible to save the child. So very sad situation here, guys, that a young uh, boy for sure lost his life in this attack due to the rubble falling on him after the building had collapsed. Um, and it, it took them nearly 24 hours to completely... Uh, save the people that were trapped under the rubble in this building as uh, the building apparently was very unstable as we can see a large portion of it has caved out and fallen apart so very sad unfortunate situation here's another report from Blaskovka emergency rescue and rubble removal operations have been completed in in Kharkiv uh, the Russian strike killed three people including two children another 36 people were injured so these are some pictures that were being released from Ukraine's uh, Ministry of Defense showing the rescue workers here trying to save the people trapped under the rubble even leading into the daytime. So definitely seemed like a long operation trying to get these people out and very unfortunate again three people uh, losing their lives two children and 36 being injured in this strike last night in Kharkiv and it's very sad you know Kharkiv is getting hit almost every single day and I know maybe some people would say this is not news uh, but I believe it is because people are losing their lives, innocent people that don't want to be any part are part of this war, especially the uh, poor people of, of Kharkiv. They're so close to the border of, uh, of Russia, so it's very easy for Russia to strike this building with glide bombs, which we have seen probably hundreds, if not thousands, of glide bombs being dropped on this city already. So from Anton Gershenko, rescuers have found a body of a 15-year-old boy, Boris, under the rubble in Kharkiv, Boris is probably no longer alive as he sustained very serious injuries and spent too many hours under the debris. The rescuers are trying to decide how to get him out as the building is not stable. So this was uh, in regards to uh, that that uh, young boy that was trapped under the rubble. So this is apparently his aunt. Um, and uh, just pay attention to what she has to say. She's here uh, speaking to somebody recording, uh, discussing the situation of this boy being trapped under the rubble. Take a look. 44 seconds long. Здесь они выбрались сразу, их достали. 
а туда они не смогли дойти, потому что там обвалилось все в коридор, и они не смогли пройти никак, ни отсюда, ни оттуда. All right, so very hard to watch, right? Uh, very sad thing to see. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, as we understand, this little boy did lose his life in this attack. So, uh, you know, this is what the city of Kharkiv sees quite a bit. I've reported on Kharkiv many times. And once again, a very devastating airstrike inside of Kharkiv just yesterday. Okay, so a few more things to show you guys before we get you out of here from Anton Yeroshenko. The winter of 2024 to 2025 will be one of the most difficult in previous years. Ukrenergo is preparing for several possible scenarios for this winter, Alexei Brecht, uh, acting CEO of Ukrenergo, said. So this is uh, regarding Ukraine's energy system, okay? There are three options, including the worst-case scenario, which include the continuation of massive shelling of infrastructure, transmission network, generation facilities, and so on, Brecht noted. The worst case scenario for the winter that is being considered is the continuation of Russia's massive attacks on generation facilities under this scenario, given the volume of electricity imports that we have today. We may have a limitation of electricity capacity on critical cold days up to two rounds of outages schedules. No more. That is up to eight hours. Brecht uh, emphasized in the spring due to Russian shelling, Ukraine lost nine gigawatts of generating capacity which is equal to the summer electricity consumption of the netherlands or the nightly electricity consumption of ukraine in the summer according to brecht it is a significant loss okay so here's a picture of outages uh inside ukraine and uh this is definitely going to be a tough winter for ukraine they've already been coming out and stating this for months now uh as ukraine's electricity grid is completely battered due to russian strikes Many of their energy uh, infrastructure in Ukraine has been destroyed. We've had reports uh, from DTEC, one of their major energy companies in Ukraine, reporting that 80% of their facilities were destroyed. So a large percentage of Ukraine's energy infrastructure is already gone. And to going into the winter, you know, they're going to need a lot of electricity to stay warm. It gets very cold inside Ukraine. And uh, it's going to be a harsh and tough winter for the Ukrainians. And uh, hopefully we do not have a major humanitarian crisis breaking out um, as people are going to struggle to stay warm over here in the winter time. So it's very sad again for Ukraine. Also, a few more things here from Max24. Protective nets were spotted at the Moscow refinery. We've got a couple pictures here as the Moscow refinery was just attacked a few months ago. I did a whole report on that. And it looks like the Russians are now putting up protective nets to protect this facility from drone attacks as uh, this is what this facility was hit by last time, uh, just several months back. And apparently it uh, did put a halt to production over here, and they took a huge hit, lots of losses in oil after it was struck. So we've got a couple pictures here to show you guys of these nets being uh, uh, placed up over here to protect the Moscow refinery. So we'll see if that does anything to protect it if it comes under attack again. Finally, one last thing from Max24. Norway will, will transfer F-16s to Ukraine already this year, as well as NASAMS uh, systems as part of a new $500 million aid package. The funds are planned to be allocated for the purchase of weapon systems and spare parts for Ukrainian F-16s as part of the U.S. Jumpstart initiative. Norway is also ready to invest in the Ukrainian defense industry following the example of Denmark. So it looks like we're going to be getting more F-16s over to Ukraine and also NASAM systems. I believe those are air defense systems if I'm correct on that um and uh yeah obviously ukraine needs more f-16s we're also hearing from the french they're supposed to be delivering some mirage fighter jets as well i think somewhere around five or six something like that uh to start out and they may be getting more in the future so uh ukraine's air force is slowly building up but definitely not as fast as they would like and we also know that i think upwards of 200 pilots are currently being trained in the uk right now to pilot these f-16s so who knows maybe by next year they could have upwards of uh, dozens of F-16s and uh, maybe hundreds in the near future as well. So just wanted to share a few updates coming out from the war between Russia and Ukraine. I hope you did get something out of this. Also, it is Halloween today. So if you decide to head out and uh, take your kids out or maybe take yourself out or go to a party or something like that, definitely try to be safe tonight. But nonetheless, enjoy yourself. So happy Halloween to everybody today on October 31st, 2024. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and if you did, please smash that like button. Also, if you enjoy my content, 
please consider subscribing down below. Hit the notification bell. That way YouTube can notify you. And with that, hope you all have a great day. Everybody take care and God bless. And we'll see you in the next one.